Welcome back to Worth the Effort Woodworking and our Start Woodworking series. This is going to be the seventh class in that series, and we're going to be covering the lap joint of this one. This is also going to be a slight transition because we are now past our midterm exams, so to speak. So, a lot of it now, we're going to ramp up the amount of knowledge we're going to be presenting, shorten the time span because it's less important for us to do the basics. I don't need to show you how to do a knife line, undercut stuff, how to hold the chisel, how to work the saw, that kind of stuff. Now we're just kind of applying the knowledge we learned in the first half of the semester and the prerequisites, so of course, into what we're learning for the future woodworking. And the lab joint is where we're starting now. So a lap joint is a glue joint. It does not work without glue. And basically you will commonly see it in like the ends of boards where you will cut halfway through each board and lay one on top of the other. Or midway through a board where you do the kind of same thing. A lot of times you'll see those in doors and stuff like that. And a lot of times you cut halfway through each side and go right through the middle. It is basically a cross grain, long grain to long grain glue joint, which means you have the long grain. This is where your strength comes together. Now in the past we did a dado joint where a lot of the techniques for cutting it are the same, but one side of it was in grain here, and when you cut halfway through, the top and bottom were also in grain. So it was a long grain to in grain joint, which is not very strong, which is why you kind of put it in the middle of a board where you have something else on the top and bottom that are keeping it together, and this is just kind of locked in there. But a lap joint can be a lot of the same way, with the exception that you're not going to have the top and bottom if you don't want to. You can use glue, and the long grain to long grain is going to give you the best adhesion. The downside is if you have very long laps, well, we all know that wood expands this way a lot more than it expands up and down because it's like a zombie if you watched the prerequisite course. Well, here's a situation where you will have this board expanding this way and this board expanding that way. And certain glues will, uh, will lose a lot of their strength in the shearing apart of their uh, molecules or fibers or bonding or whatever you want to call it. So that is something we have to take into consideration. Which is why a lot of times you don't see lap joints a lot of places in fine upper end furniture. They'll use it in certain places where it isn't too critical, but not in really structural areas. But you will find a lot of lap joints in construction industry, especially timber framing. Because, you know, a lot of times you will have beams running across and you'll want to put one beam on top of the other but seat it so you cut halfway through each one to get the strength there. It just means you have to have really incredibly big beams because you're basically taking away half of their strength at a certain portion of the, of the board. Hopefully not halfway through a stressed member. But when you are gluing something together like a lab joint, you basically have two different kind of... Uh, for lack of a better term, adhesions. For one, if you glue one board on the end, like this right here, well, you have the glue holding these two together so they won't split this way. But then you have some shear strength where it won't slide that way. And this is one of the key things where lap joints can let people down if they are under stress. Because the sheer design of the lap joint means you're giving it leverage to exasperate its shearing weakness. The example I'm going to use to illustrate a lab joint is going to be a small cabinet door. A very lightweight cabinet door just for decorative purposes. Okay, But the same aspect of this design would work for you know a front door or anything else that might be a lot heavier in design. So this entire thing is a lap joint. And this intellectual exercise will explain to you why lap joints make horrible door joints. 
I want you to look at this design. We have a lap joint here. Each board is going halfway over into the other so that they're the same thickness. We got a lap joint here, 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 and there. Which one of these joints is going to give the door its mechanical strength? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Okay? Pause it if you need a little bit more time. You figured it out? Well, it was a trick question. I said mechanical strength, and earlier I told you that a lab joint was dependent upon a glue bond. Well, you can have both a glue bond and a mechanical strength depend upon the joinery. A dovetail is a perfect example. You know, if you have your dovetail clicked up and down so that you can't pull a board this way, but you can slide it that way, well, the glue is what holds it so it doesn't slide apart, but the mechanical joint prevents it from going up and down. Well, a lap joint can be the same exact way. These upper corners right there are purely a glue bond. In fact, the mechanical aspect works against the glue bond in those situations. You have two different types of glue bond. You know, that glue bond that's keeping the boards from separating this way, and then the shear strength where it's preventing it from sliding back and forth right there. Well, it takes a lot of force to slide it this way, almost as much to slide it that way. In fact, more than likely, the wood fibers will break with most modern glues. But, I want you to imagine if we had just this one door right here. You have your door panel coming across. Here's the camera. And then the one panel coming down. This right here being the lab joint. Well, it doesn't take much strength to keep these from separating this way. But if the door's weight is pushing down here, well, that is actually separating out these two angles. It's actually wanting to stretch it out down here and you get torque coming around there. So what ends up happening is it pivots off of that point right there, thus magnifying that torque aspect of the gravity and increasing the shear load on that thing. If on the other corners over here it would be more of a compression and then that point would become the fulcrum increasing the shear pressure up around here. So the, the just the nature of gravity is working against the shear strength of a glue joint and lap joints unless you house it in the middle of a board. This joint right here all of a sudden, you have the upright coming here, this board coming through it, and now in order for this to rotate in any direction, you have to compress end grain right there. And end grain is very strong. So the end grain itself eliminates a lot of the shear force acting against a glue joint and all the glue has to do is prevent the board from coming out this way or technically sliding out that way but that that one direction versus uh, torquing is a lot harder than you think so to answer the question it's this joint right here that's more than likely going to keep this door from going angled over time now as I said the example I'm going to be doing today is making that small cabinet door just because it'll give me lots of opportunities to show you different techniques to accomplish that task, mainly with hand tools because that's what we're doing here, but also along with that bandsaw, the one power tool we have along the area. But don't say that you have to build a cabinet door. There are a lot of different uh, projects you can do that will let you explore lab joint building techniques. One of the most common ones I've always did in the school was making a little comp, uh, front English square. It's a lap joint here, and it's a encased lap joint on either side, just at an angle. And then you have the end lap joints are in an open lap joint on the end. Okay, fairly simple design. One cool aspect of this one is because there's enclosed ones here. There's really no force here, and this thing will stay true for a very long time. Uh, you can also stretch yourself on the design you know i have a i have several videos making that one then i did a kind of an artsy fartsy video making this one where i did a dovetail lab joint 
So now, not only do you have this strength here on either way, where it's not coming out mechanically, and all this thing, this has to do, the glue has to do, is prevent it from sliding out that way. A good way to do it. Other, if you want to stick with just tools and just practice one lap joint in a project that takes you 10 minutes, you know, uh, make yourself a French square. I'm sure you can figure out how to do that with a lap joint. But as I said, I need a door, so we're going to make a door here. So I'm going to go ahead and prep that material like I've done in past lessons. You don't need to see that again. And when we come back, we'll start making those lap joints. Okay, as a little side note, I've got all my parts to mention for the door I'm creating. This was a cabinet I made years ago in a class on dovetails, dados, rabbits, and grooves. And I'd always always meant for it to be a door, have a door on it. I just never got around to it, so I'll use this project to make the door. And this is a very boring design, straight 90 degrees. The only variations I did was I took the thickness of the side pieces, which was three quarters of an inch. I labeled that X. So this piece right here is 3X, 2X, or wait, 4X, 3X. Uh, 3x and 2x to keep the dimensions going and I like the idea of having components get smaller the farther in they go which is why these shelves are sh uh, narrower than the door than the sides anyways 90 degrees is boring it would have been cool if I had done maybe a taper on the sides or curves on the top and in those situations when you're laying out something like a lap joint the most accurate way to do it is to put your components in there and then use this as your layout gut. Actually use the piece. So if there are any human errors, maybe this is a little cockeyed or something like that, it doesn't really matter. You don't have to compensate it for it because the process you use to create the joints does a compensation for you. Now this particular one is pretty close to 90 degrees. So I'm just going to use very standard, traditional ways of laying this stuff out in my examples with gauges, you know, squares and that kind of stuff. But I wanted you to know, have a side note in that when I build a lot of my stuff where I'm putting a little bit more attention into the design or the execution of it, for the most part, I'm going to lay out my products so that there's just no free play in there. I can always sand them back a little bit to get them to fit and use this as my layout guide for all the joinery. Two other points. If you're wanting your product to be flush, you kind of need to start out with your material being flush to begin with. It seems kind of obvious, but you know, if one is thicker than the other, it's not going to be flush on both sides. You can make one side flush and the other side extending using your layout, but most of the time we want to start out with the boards being even. Second, having lab joints where each side comes down exactly halfway is very nice aesthetically and probably evens out the uh, pressure on boards and the strength, but it is not necessary. All you really need is complementary depths. A lot of times I don't even stress about setting my gauge in the dead center. I just make sure that the reference face is always the same. So I make my mark on that on either side, on, on the side, and then I just remove this side on this board and the other side on the other board coming to that line. So it's the same depth, but you're removing different proportions. So it works out all the same and it will be flush. Now to mark dead center, you can either pull out your calipers to figure it out or I will kind of eyeball it, lock my gauge down. This particular gauge has a head that will rotate, so I have like a micro adjuster on it. Easy peasy. And then you can just kind of uh, guess me. If I mark a line on this side, I mark a line on that side. I now know the dead center is going to be in the middle of those two lines, so I can come in about halfway lock it down again mark halfway one side halfway the other and when both of those are in the same line 
I know I'm in the dead center, so I will lock my gauge so it can't be moved and don't change this for the entire project. And this is one of those situations where having two marking gauges is a real luxury, which is why I have two and only two basically, because I can leave one for that thickness and never touch it again. And then I can use a second one for all the shoulders, so to speak. But if you only have one marking gauge, do all your shoulders first and then set that thickness because you're going to want to be able to use this as your depth gauge, very similar to the way we did on the dados when that time comes. Now how you set the shoulders when you do have a depth uh, a, a gauge is, you know, simply use the product as your measurement. It's why a lot of these gauges don't even have rulers on them at all because just people, you just take the measurement off the corresponding piece, lock it down. Now this particular design I have, all the, the bottom piece is the thickest one, so all I'm going to do is mark these all the way around on my marking gauge with my marking gauge. And I am trying to make a pretty heavy cut. I like this better than a pin adjuster because this wheel, the bevel is flat here. I've talked about that earlier and the angle is there, which means I end up with a very crisp line a show line and that slight bevel with a very deep cut will help my saw sneak up on that line. Now if you don't have that kind of gauge you can still use just the simple knife and square technique we've used in the past. All you got to do is line up your boards make sure that they are flush on all sides and then make a nick. Lay your knife, the flat side, right there and just make a nice heavy nick on the corner. Then you can take your square and remember using the reference edge so that if this is ever so slightly out of square, it doesn't really matter, mark your line all the way across. I am using a wooden square which that orange plastic one would work just fine. This is what I have had available in my hand. And with this technique, because the blade is flat here, the bevel is over there, we enjoy the same advantage as that marking wheel. If you use a relative marking technique, your lines should all end up perfect. Voila. Now, in my particular design, you know, all these end pieces are really easy to mark with either the gauge or, you know, just laying one on top of the other. The only tricky one is going to be the one that goes across the middle because I have to get the measurements just perfectly because this particular one lines up covering up one of the shelves. So it'll look like things are actually sitting on this in the little window we have right here. So the, and because I hate measuring, one reason why I have this center piece right here, not only to make these panels sh shorter, but I can now use this as a story stick because I had the depth of this board on this side and the depth of that one on top. So now I can come over here, lay this down, flush it up with the side, and transfer the baseline to the board. And I'm just making a neck. Do that on both sides. And once again, all I'm doing is transferring the bottom of it. Now, I can lay this, drop that over, and transfer the top line, thus capturing the perfect thickness and taking as much human error out of the equation as possible. And after that, it's just using that square and marking your lines all the way around. And I'll do something very similar at a later date with the middle piece lining it up here. At this point in time, because I've made mistakes in the past so often, 
I will go ahead and lay out all the pieces that I want to be my face. This one had a blemish on it, so I would rather have the face on here. And design-wise, you know, the wood typically, the grain gets thinner the farther out the tree it goes. So I would like to have all the thin grain on the outside and it expand into the center. So I would just line my pieces up that way. And once I get all the grain I want the way I like it, I decide which piece I want to lay on top. Now I'm going to have some fun on this one. I drew it out, so I actually want to remove the top of this one and remove the bottom of this one. And then to play around, I'm going to remove the bottom here and the, to the, the top there and the bottom here. Just to have a little fun. Remove the top. Remove the bottom. And after that, now is the time to mark your midway point. So grab your gauge. And I like doing it after I mark the shoulder lines because I like a really deep line. And if you don't have that shoulder line, you don't know where to stop. And a lot of times without that, I would actually go past, which would leave a portion of the line that I had to remove off the finished piece. Having the shoulder line fir there first gives you a place to stop. You also want to make sure that the reference is always on the show face, the, 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 the side that's going to be shown to the customer. That way, if your depth is a little bit different, it won't matter because the error will complement each other on the boards, as we discussed earlier. Yeah, once again, I made a mistake. You don't have to mark your shoulders all the way around. Just mark the side that you're doing the, you're taking the piece off. Because at a later day, I'm not going to have to plane these off. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking, but mistakes happen. Now, I guess technically, the wood doesn't really care whether you cut the face first, the tendon first, or the shoulder first. But I'm here to tell you that only a sadomasochistic lunatic would cut the face first, the, the tendon first. I mean, that's the type of person who probably tries to get the toilet paper ink roll on sideways, not over the top or underneath. So I'm going to teach you the same way of doing it, the proper way, order of doing this operation. We are going to cut the shoulder first. And the carcass saw is the ideal tool to use it. It is designed cross cut, it's designed for joinery cuts, it's got a fine tooth finish on it not as much set as a uh, coarser tooth so you're going to get a nice show face cut you're not going to have to clean it up this is the purpose of the saw in our kit why we chose it for this kind of work so grab your bench hooks Oops. and just as we've done many many times over Figure out which side of the line you're going to be cutting on. This is my waist side. Use your finger, front finger as a guide. Line it up. Get the saw moving. And then use that finger to nibble your way back. Staying on the line. Once you get all the way across, start making full length cuts. Working your way down to that baseline, keeping the tip right at the, this corner. It's not going any deeper on this side. We're coming down to the baseline here. And just letting it sit gravity-wise, bounced up, you should make, be able to make a very nice long cut. This is not over a very long distance, so even if you're off a tad bit, not that big a deal. Now, I do know a lot of people will actually, they will try to start on this side of the line and then as they come down, split the line. So they're actually undercutting a tad bit. That will ensure that this will bump up really hardly against the other one. But at this point in time, you know, just go plumb. Once you get down to the baseline on this side, continue sawing, but work your focus more on that side. And I will literally just keep it plumb and level. When I'm ready, look over, see how far down I've gone. Mm -hmm. 
and once I'm on the line on both sides, I will then take the tip of my saw and work the center a little bit more because more than likely you've got a hump in there. Because this is an operation that these tools were actually designed to do, this is not a situation where we are using a tool just kind of adjacent to the designated purpose. Well, once you get a pattern going, it actually goes really, really quick. You get a feel for it, and it won't take you but maybe five minutes to cut all the shoulders. You'll be surprised at how good it gets. On the next one. And I will say that at the thickness of material we are working with here, you know, if you go a little bit past the line, not the end of the world. So now we're going to start cutting tenons. And this is going to be something you're going to do quite a bit in your woodworking career, even especially if you're hand tool focused. So I want to do a little thought experiment, okay? We have a couple different options here. A lot of people will advocate, you know, starting at the top and sawing straight down. Some people, many times you've heard me say, start on the far side, work your way across, then saw down the face, and then come down the top, okay? That could be wrong in this situation, because basically you're starting this direction and sawing like that. Some people will say start on this far corner, come down the face, and then swing it down. So, if you've ever taken a chisel, you can try to go straight across a grain. And it is extremely, I mean, I'm putting all my weight into it. And this is a fairly sharp tool, and granted pine isn't that hard, but it is pretty hard. Okay? The other option would be as we said, starting at this angle right here. That would be like, you know, this bevel is now pointing up. I could come over here. What happens if I just tap it? Fibers break. It's fairly smooth. Now, what's going to happen if I do it this way? Do the same exact thing, coming, except this time the angle is coming down. Oh, the wood just broke. It's a deal with, there's no fibers over here to support the cut. On this way, I'm actually going with the grain. This action, I'm actually going against the grain and you get tear out or splits. So when you're cutting a tenon, a lot of times what I will do is I will actually start with my board on its side like that. Start on this corner. So see, I'm going with the grain come down the face till I hit my baseline and then write it up. And it's not until the very end where you get to the point where you're going straight across the grain where it's very hard. This is why a lot of times you see me in my past videos, I angle the board when I'm doing tenon cuts. This is also because this clamp is kind of low. There's a reason why we put mocks and vices up on our workbench so that we can cut about where our elbow level is. That is the natural angle. It's comfortable for your back. Right now, I'm having to bend over. If I had this straight up and down, I would actually have to be dropping down my body to get the angle. By angling the wood, I can keep my elbow more in line. And what I'm going to do, this is now the waist side, so I'm going to be cutting on this side of the line. I will place my finger right on that line, come over, and I'm just going to focus on sawing right next to the line coming down. Okay. Me personally, instead of writing it up going across the top, I will then reverse it in my vise. Now sawing on this side of the line and do the same exact thing. And what I'm in effect doing 
is creating a path of least resistance. So now I can connect the two lines and my saw perf will now want to track from this corner down to my baseline over here. Just maintaining my sight line on the where I want to be over here. If I get off, I don't stress about it. I come over, loosen my clamp, switch it over to the other side, and get back on the line on this side. And that will correct it over there. So I come back over, make sure I'm on my line, start sawing, saw across till I hit that corner, and then come down baseline on this side. Once I hit my baseline over here, technically I could just ride it up. It will probably stay on the line. But me wanting to be as accurate as I possibly can, I will take it out, reverse it. Notice I now no longer have it as angled. And then come down the line to the baseline here. Now I'm actually taking this piece, which is getting kind of loose, and pressing it this way to squeeze my squeeze the blade and make sure it tracks straight. And then on the very last bit, notice I'm now going straight across the end grain. And what do I end up with? a fairly straight and flat cut. Just need to clean up right here a little bit. Pretty straight, pretty flat, ready to be glued. Now the small bandsaw we have in this course, it is perfect for cutting the faces of tenons and or Morris and tenons and stuff like that. Uh, ideal tool for it. You can rapidly do a whole bunch of them. And if you're doing multiple doors, yeah, set the time. Uh, I mean, you are basically going to have to cut eight shoulders on this on this particular door project, not including, including the middle ones, which we, we have to do with the chisel. But the thing is, you have to set up the bandsaw twice per door. It's not as simple as just throwing it in a clamp and sawing to the line. You also have to basically tune your bandsaw before most cuts. Uh, you have to make sure your fence is 90 degrees to the bed. I'm going to have to make a few adjustments on my fence to get that. Then you're going to have to make sure the bed is a perfect 90 degrees to the blade. This one is pretty good. Uh, there is generally a screw down underneath that will allow you to adjust it and lock that down. So right now, I'll take a quick break and I'm going to adjust the fence. But I told you you had to do set this thing up twice. Well, you have to take in consideration the saw blade has a curve, just like the saw on your handsaw. And if you set it up once to cut on this side of the line, well, it's not going to cut the other side of the line for the other pieces. So. You will have to basically set it up for all the short sides and then set it up for all the long sides. If you are constantly referencing the show side, which I highly recommend, that's the way you do it. Some people are able to reference the show side one direction and then reference the back side on the other. It's kind of been hit and miss for me whether that technique works. So I basically just make sure that I reset it for the underside and it'll work okay. Now obviously you do not want to practice these cuts on your good piece. And remember me telling you that you know you always mark from the show face? Well this is a situation where you can grab just any piece of wood. It doesn't really matter how thick it is. You put the marker on the show face to make a test line cut and that goes against a fence. That way you can line the blade up perfectly on a practice piece. Then when it get, you get dialed in, then go to the, the pieces that are more important. And on a bandsaw, it's always just a lot of trial and error.
As you're making these cuts on the bandsaw, just take it nice and slow. Give the saw a chance to work. If you start rushing it, sawdust will build up on the inside and it might bow or warp or go offline or something like that. This is a very slow cut so you can make a precise cut. And there we go. All the outside tin ends are now cut and a simple dry fit, yeah, we did pretty good, both the hand cut ones and the bandsaw cut ones. And it took me, I'll be honest, on this amount of work, it took me longer to dial in that bandsaw and reset it than it would have taken to cut the, the by hand eight times. Uh, but once you set it up, that's generally the way you're going to do it. The next part is we now need to cut the opposite sides for the centerpiece. And this is going to be one of those situations where you're going to repeat the same techniques you did elsewhere back when we cut datodes for the same situation. The only difference between a dado and this is it's a little bit wider. So I've cut my two shoulders and I've got my baseline right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to clamp it to my workbench. And just like I did with my dado, taking the bevel, turning it up, so now it's ramping up. I'm going to come over to the side, come down, and give it a good chop, seeing how it splits. And then I'm just going to work it like that, creating a ramp up from my baseline. Now that I'm at the base, I just drop my chisel right in that baseline. Notice I read the grain so it split coming up this way and not down into the deeper portion of the board. I'm creating, creating that ramp. Just like that. Flip it around. Do the same exact thing to the other side this time starting on this side because it splits coming up that way. So I know it's not going to split down deeper. Now that you've got a ramp on both sides, the idea is we're going to continue splitting it off this way, gradually working it down until we are at the base, base bottom of a ramp here and bottom of a ramp there. So now I just turn my chisel so the bevel is coming up and I just start removing waste. You don't have to be too delicate here because this is going to be where your glue joint is. So who really cares because nobody has x-ray vision. They're not going to see this, this portion of your work. I'm just about at the bottom of the ramp on this side. Still got what? An eighth of an inch on that side? So you just slowly work your way down. key thing to remember is that the strength of this part of your joint doesn't really come from this right here. It comes from those shoulders. Remember our reasoning?
And if you go a little bit past your line, don't stress about it because the other board's going to cover that up. So if you can put your chisel down and it's flat all the way across, you know you don't have a hump. So you did a pretty good job. So looky there, we now have the lab joints all the way around and they are all flush. Who knew? It's almost like we planned it that way. And there we go. A complete door made basically with just lab joints. Yeah, I added some grooves and stuff like that, but that's irrelevant for this lesson. If you stick around to the end, I'll give you a bonus tip, again, irrelevant to lab joints, but if you're making doors or cabinets, you'll like it. Now, I want you to think about something. This door and all its joints, we didn't learn anything new. Think about the skills you required to make this door. A lot of it we recovered in the prerequisite course. Understanding grain direction being the most important. After that, it was just, you know, knowing how to sharpen a chisel and some very basic chisel skills, being able to saw to a line, and some basic layout techniques so that you can create those lines in the proper place. Not much more. And you'll see a recurring theme over and over and over the more you progress down this hobby. It really comes down to, can you lay out the line? Can you saw the line? and take grain direction into consideration no matter what the joint is or the joinery technique you use well i hope you enjoyed this video and learned, got a few tips out of it please remember that you know us content creators we are basically the modern day street performance firms we try to provide a little bit of value for you and hope that we get a little bit of value back so please check out the description down below for all the different ways you can support me and this channel and even if it is just passing along word about what we do. Now for that bonus tip. A lot of times the hard part is getting your reveals really close. I'm off down below. See this right here? Well, my door is actually a very even reveal all the way around except for down on the bottom. And I actually kind of like doing this. I will actually cut just the slightest of angles right here so that this board is going to rest on that piece of wood right there. That way I know that if over time it moves or something like that, it's still got that reference point. And if you are up in the air over here, it will slide in right there and get a nice seal. But that is quite obvious. So a simple trick is don't worry about the entire part, just worry about the reveal. A slight bevel with your block plane, work your way back. And little by little, you will create the even shadow line. Just keep working at it until you get it the way you like. There we go. Nice even shadow line going all the way across. Now y'all be sure to come back to the next class because that's when we are going to be covering probably the most important joint in all of woodworking, the mortise and tenon. And as I leave you, please remember that it is always worth the effort to learn, create, share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.